Good morning, one and all. The guest speaker for today is Mr. Sunil Ankalgi, sir. Mr. Sunil Ankalgi, sir, is currently holding the position of Head of Sales Account Management in Amidius, which he joined in 2018. He looks after the Asia Pacific countries and is responsible for the work which is selling and managing customer relations within airports across the Asia Pacific countries. Uncle Sir has over 20 years of experience in working in aviation and IT sectors and is an experienced sales and business leader with demonstrated performance in air transport domain. Let me mention with special pride that Uncle Sir is an alumnus of IMDR and is a pass out of 1996 after graduating from IMDR and working for about eight years, he went on to take his management education forward and obtained qualification from Nanyang University in Singapore and Cranfield School of Management in England. He started his career with HCL Hewlett Packard as accounts executive. After two years stint there, he went on to work for HCL Infosystems and iGate Singapore. In 2002, he joined Singapore Air Terminal Services, SATS, as is commonly known. Perhaps he had found his real calling in the field of airport handling systems and the IT services related to it, and has been associated with this field ever since. He charted a wonderful career by rising from the stage of accounts executive, where he started through positions like sales manager and senior project manager in various companies like Provio and CETA. He, uh, he has now reached develop head sales and account management airports for Asia Pacific countries at Amadeus Group and is currently located, uh, located at Singapore. Friends, let me once again say how proud we are in welcoming such an illustrious alumnus of IMDR to share his experience and wisdom with us. Let's all welcome him and look forward for an enriching interaction. Over to you, sir. Thanks a lot for that. It was a really good readout uh, of my LinkedIn profile. Uh, very impressive. You did it better than I can explain my own career myself. So, Thank you, so thanks for that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the, I would like to welcome the current batch. I guess this is PGDM one and two, both, um, both classes, or is it just PDM, PGDM two? Sir, it is PGDM two. Ah, OK, so you guys are in the final year. All of you have done your summer internships as um, as uh, Shruti ma'am just indicated earlier. Um, so you've you've done your your work in, in the industry. Uh, I'm sure some of you are already experienced. Some of you are uh, fresh. Um, so yeah, I would like to first start by wishing you all the best for your careers going forward. Um, to get into the agenda of uh, of our discussion today, it's a very, very wide subject and you will get multiple perspectives on the same topic from different experts uh, looking looking at the situation from uh, with different glasses or lenses. Um, so today my my perspective is going to be the way um, I see the government controlling and um, and managing the situation as well as how it impacts um, my own industry in a very brief um, uh, set of slides. I'm not one much for words, but I love interaction. Uh, so I don't have 50 slides. I have maybe five or six slides, but a lot of content in there. Um, I would request that all of you please take the opportunity to to speak frankly um, and ask any questions you have. If I do not have the answers, um, I would be able to direct you to resources um, that you can look up after uh, after this session um, and just going back to some of the memories i mean i come from a time in imdr when uh, when all we had was uh, the imdr canteen and the rock band metallica to look forward to um, whereas you guys um, now you know you guys have much more resources at your uh, at your disposal um, so yes i come from that black and white uh, tv world yeah So I hope I can get into this uh, the 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 agenda proper. I'm going to share my um, my slides now. So the the topic I was given is um, the post-COVID uh, unlock business unlock.
the while the while the topic was quite vague but i have tried to get as much uh, information as possible and and to give you a perspective of of what is happening in singapore and perhaps also just a brief glance into what's happening in the aviation industry okay so it is good to know which is the country and where it is located on the map um not many people might not know uh, although i hope you have looked up the map so you can see singapore is this one small little dot we call it the pimple on the face of southeast asia uh, many many of these countries around who compete with singapore uh, also hope that this pimple will burst someday but uh, singapore is still going strong um so as far as covid is concerned i'm not going to go into we all know how it has rolled out and all that i'm just going to look at what are the costs the economic costs uh, to singapore um due to due to the current situation we are in so hold on um so the gdp of singapore last year was around 372 billion which is not a huge amount compared to like 21 trillion uh, us economy or similarly 3 around just close to 3 trillion of the indian uh, economy so singapore is the 34th largest amongst the whatever 220 odd countries in this world with a population of just around 5.7 million i think this is even slightly lesser than i think the 7 million population that pune has yeah so it's a smaller population but i think the land area is uh, is around the same as uh, as the main pune Uh, city the economy this year is expected to shrink between 4 to 7% uh, this year compared compared to what it was uh, last year and that's a huge huge um, uh, impact to singapore because singapore being a mature economy it grows at maybe 3 or 4% per year anyway so it's like we are going negative uh, zero to negative So yeah any questions once again please feel free to ask okay i'll be pausing uh, for a while in between um, open your mics and and talk to me so some of you who are interested in numbers um, and i'm sure there are quite a number of you i just wanted to show when when you say the economy is going to shrink what is this economy mainly made of so if you look at it there's uh, yeah, if you look at the graph uh, uh, the pie chart below the structure of singapore economy 2018 yes but uh, 2019 also there wasn't much change so it's still quite relevant you can see that services is a huge amount 70 point 70% so um, it means any any impact to one service industry has a big domino effect on the others and you can all imagine what it would have done to the economy with this uh, current covid situation uh, manufacturing is the next uh, uh, biggest uh, contributor um manufacturing is more in the in terms of electronic semiconductors you know, uh, and such um there's also construction but yeah it is key uh, but it it doesn't contribute that much okay so any any questions here you can see uh, i will focus on the services sector the services sector is mainly made up of uh, finance insurance trade trade which is what which is the reason why singapore exists Singapore is a huge trading hub so uh, as far as Singapore is concerned we look at we look at uh, the seaport and the airport that we have as as the key contributors to the entire economy anything that happens to the the two ports is a huge impact to the to the country uh, then there's uh, there's other services that you normally have in any economy like uh, hospitals educations and and such so it is Uh, Singapore is what is called a mice destination. So uh, meetings, incentives, uh, conferences, and events. So you have your F1 races. You've got your uh, large uh, expos that uh, that happen in Singapore. They contribute a lot to the service uh, economy. Uh, food and services. Um, people uh, in Singapore love food. So Singapore is a is a destination for food. If you want global food, uh, and it's one of the key. Uh, contributors which also keeps many of singaporeans uh, employed um, because uh, there are there is a huge uh, the, the the most one of the most common businesses that uh, that singaporeans do get into is setting up uh, food stalls at food courts um, and it's huge business here 
IT is becoming big. Uh, Singapore is positioning itself as the most stable, most secure um, uh, country in the world um, and trying to attract uh, data centers, cloud cloud hostings and such. So, so this is what the Singapore economy is made of. Uh, if you look at the economic cost, which is in which is tabulated here, and I've compared only the first quarter, which is when actually, uh, seriously speaking, uh, the the COVID had not yet impacted the entire world except for China. China was uh, was on a high, but the rest of the world was still ignoring, you know, until March. However, there has been an indirect impact. So, if you look at good goods producing which is manufacturing and construction i'm only going to highlight those ones which i've uh, put in pink so you will see that uh, the the growth in 2019 was just 0.7 percent but in the first quarter itself it got wiped out yeah so so even year on year just in one quarter that that whole annual growth has been wiped out in um, uh, uh, from a from a total perspective manufacturing has somewhat jumped up to 6.6 percent but construction has um, has completely fallen down and and this uh, minus four actually came, would have come up in in march when singapore started clamping down and everybody was put under lockdown so it that it had a very serious impact you will see the uh, impact on accommodation and food services so hotels restaurants bars which contributes a lot to the economy down by 23.8 percent um, but there are some bright spots. Uh, if you look at finance and insurance, has gone up actually, and and that's, I guess you you could say that's quite natural. People would be more concerned about uh, finances and and ensuring that they have, they protect their wealth. So that has gone up, um, and and this is what it is year on year. If you look at it quarter quarter over quarter, you will see the biggest once again the biggest drop is in accommodation and food services, um, dropped by seventy percent. Uh, travel and transport has also dropped uh, to a similar amount. My own industry, which is uh, the uh, aviation industry in Singapore, it, I, I remember that in the whole month of March, there were hardly three or four flights per day compared to um, at least uh, uh, what we call a thousand turnarounds, meaning around 550 over flights a day. It just came down to three or four flights, so you can you can imagine the impact that the uh, the entire um, airport was uh, was just empty um, however uh, there was some bright spots uh, because people could not move cargo was moving but cargo the capacity is limited and hence uh, cargo was fully at full capacity but you know the, we couldn't make uh, take advantage of it and hence you will see transportation and storage has also dropped down by by over 30 percent and these two really reflect what has happened with Singapore the accommodation food services and transportation and storage uh, that hits everywhere in the 70.4 percent uh, services that uh, that uh, is shown in the pie chart so now where are we in um, in June so we are we are uh, uh, now in uh, in sort of uh, I don't have the second quarter uh, numbers as it it's not yet been published. Um, so uh, where are we now in uh, as far as uh, June is concerned and where we stand? Um, so Singapore has declared that they are in a recession now and the economy is expected to shrink more than 40 percent quarter on quarter in second quarter. So compared to the first quarter, which we are already bad at, as you can see on the in the table in the second quarter, we are going to be even 40 percent lower which is uh, which is huge you know, although there are bright spots manufacturing has expanded by 2.5 percent year on year not much anyway Singapore is not a manufacturing hub so uh, this this I guess um, uh, would be expected construction has plunged it means infrastructure uh, buildings uh, the main mainstay of Singapore as we we have a saying in Singapore that and this is what everyone believes that one must always invest in real estate because land is not growing in Singapore and for construction to plunge means uh, people are not buying um, apartments they are not renting apartments and uh, and such and this is uh, real estate is one uh, is a big thing um, uh, in Singapore just the way uh, in India we were always uh, brought up to believe that uh, any extra money you have you must invest in gold you know 
So similarly in Singapore, it is a real estate. And services uh, producing industries contracted by 13.6%. So this is everything from the two huge casinos we have, which uh, contribute um, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, every quarter uh, to the economy, to all the mice related uh, uh, industries. So does someone want to say something? Sir, uh, I would like to ask one question. Uh, I am Dr. Abhijit Shune. Um, yes, sir. Hello. Yes, yes, uh, I can hear you. Sir, uh, what I could understand from this uh, statistics is that uh, Singapore economy is uh, dependent upon the outside world. I think. Uh, basically, that uh, accommodation and food services. Uh, is it so? Uh, is it dependent on tourism and transportation, passenger transport? Yes, the two two biggest things uh, that that Singapore has no natural resources of its own. Okay, what what Singapore is big on is trade. So it means people and goods transit through Singapore, and and the economy makes money on on uh, on the people and goods that transit through. Um, uh, through the city. Uh, so uh, you may not expect it, but Singapore is one of the largest uh, oil refineries in this world. It's got no natural resources, but it is still, I think, second or third largest refinery in the world. Um, the trade that happens, which is goods coming from other countries and then being bulk broken into smaller, smaller shipments going out to different countries like China, India, Indonesia, uh, all these countries, that is big business. The breaking down of bulk and, and shipping it to other countries, that is big. As well as uh, passengers and people, businessmen traveling through. Um, the the other two industries which are coming up are uh, finance. So it is becoming, Singapore is slowly becoming the financial hub, uh, as well as for uh, IT. Um, so yes, uh, you're right in the sense that uh, that everything, we are very closely linked to the global economy, anyone sneezes anywhere, we feel the fever. Uh, because uh, what we do is, uh, what we do is, we are a tran transitory uh, city for for people, goods, and uh, uh, information. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Abhijit here. Sir, I want to ask you that uh, Singapore slums into a recession, and its GDP plunges by. A record of like 40 percent you have said so what will be impact on the job sector the upcoming employability sector yeah so i'm going to hold that uh, hold that question for now and if i don't address it in the next few slides uh, you can uh, you can just remind me okay. hello sir yeah go ahead uh, good morning sir uh, I just wanted to know that uh, as now uh, the news are coming out that uh, factories are moving out of China. So would that be uh, beneficial for Singapore in, uh, in the sense as it located uh, located close to the uh, China and has a good infrastructure for transportations accommodations. Yeah, so uh, I mean, and that's why that's why I felt it important to show where we are. So you can see Singapore is here, China is is all the way here. So we are not very close. There are com competitive countries like uh, Vietnam and uh, Thailand in between, uh, who would who would greatly benefit and and Philippines would greatly benef benefit from any um, uh, organizations going out. Because Singapore doesn't have uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the amount of land and infrastructure to support huge industries. Uh, like car manufacturing and such, which which you would have in countries like China. Uh, so I have been on on forums where we've talked about, um, uh, I mean, on a global forum where we've, we've talked about who would benefit most from uh, companies moving out of China. The first point was that while this might be the sentiment, it is very difficult for companies to move out of China because there's infrastructure investment, there's people investment and everything which others cannot match. So no, I don't think there's going to be big benefit for Singapore from that. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, yeah. So let me go to the next slide. Uh, and thanks. I mean, uh, I'm I'm okay with three or four questions uh, per per slide so that we don't get stuck. But please keep your questions coming. 
Mm, let me also see. Um, yeah, I can't. While I'm presenting, I cannot um, see the chat, so I'll have to address the chat later. Um, so we looked at the economic costs. Uh, uh, where is Singapore, and how is it reacting to um, to what what all is uh, uh, to COVID specifically? So economic is one thing, but what are we doing locally? You know, to uh, to react or to um, respond to this situation. So what you see uh, on this slide is on the top is uh, pre-COVID, post-COVID, you know, so different key iconic landmarks of Singapore. The main the main thing is uh, in the center. Uh, in fact, even in my own personal case, if you look at the picture you put up on, from LinkedIn, that was pre-COVID and what you see now is post-COVID. So you can see uh, there is deterioration in, 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 a, in a certain sense uh, in everyday life. Um, so Singapore, as of now, not doing very bad uh, compare it to Pune. I mean, uh, you can look at Pune and Singapore and and uh, do a bit of comparison. So confirmed cases, 46,000 recovered, 42,000 deaths, only 26. OK, uh, compared to what is globally uh, happening, and we all know that. Um, and uh, and this is po this has been made possible because um, because the government has played a huge leadership role um, as far as uh, leading not only the people but also the industry uh, in Singapore and it becomes some might say it becomes easy because Singapore is a very uh, nicely controlled um, uh, city which has a proper ring fence around it um, and there's there's not much uh, heterogeneity as you see in larger countries like uh, like India. So what what Singapore did as a first thing was close down its borders as soon as WHO declared it as a pandemic. Um, so that is what did. it was a complete. Uh, it was a very strict uh, lockdown, uh, but it was not a complete lockdown. It was just strict with lots of rules, regulations, which everyone had to follow or there were heavy, heavy penalties. People have lost their uh, their work permits their permanent residencies because they have broken rules and that's how strict uh, they were indiscriminate uh, very strict um, so the, they closed down the seaport and the uh, airport so there's no people from outside coming in the whole objective was to bring the local infection down to zero it has still not come down to zero every day we still see around 300 odd uh, infections per day the second thing that that singapore did and you'll see this in the last picture is very rigorous contract tracing. So here is just an example of one of the very early cases uh, where the infection started at the Grand Hyatt Hotel in Singapore, and you will, uh, and it started from one person literally. Although it shows one point here, but it also started by one person, and you can see how they have contact traced to every individual from different countries right down to the last until it ended. And they do this for every infection that they that they encounter. So it's not just who is infected, but contact tracing uh, follow up from that. And that has been very strong. And that has helped to keep the deaths uh, under control and increase the recoveries because it's early action. Um, any any uh, thoughts or any ideas from? Uh, Oh, hello. hello, can you hear me, sir? Yes. Uh, good morning, sir. This is Shruti. Uh, sir, I just wanted to know that uh, as you have explained that the major role played by management was really good that they took leadership and that's why you can you could control this virus. But uh, what about the approach of people uh, like here when the lockdown started uh, uh, for starters, everybody was following it, but afterwards it became very lenient with the uh, whole situation. So how was the public uh, handling the rules and regulation that was, uh, you know, uh, uh, given by the uh, government? By the government, yeah. So, yeah, so the uh, everyone knows and, and I think it is very popular in, in the entire world that Singapore is called a fine city. Yeah? So we are all since we are since we land in Singapore, born in Singapore, we are always faced with the, the potential to be fined for many things for eating chewing gums, for littering uh, on the streets, uh, for uh, for doing things, for even public gatherings. 
Uh, so the rules are very strict. The rules are clear and they're very strict. And the penalties are high. So in any case, this is the way Singapore has always governed the city state. It is not an overnight thing. It is uh, it is a long standing thing uh, in Singapore. So when the government imposed uh, rules and penalties and fines, um, it was strictly followed not only by the government, but also by the businesses and industries in Singapore and also by the people of Singapore, uh, even people who live in Singapore. Uh, we uh, out of the five five point seven million uh, uh, population that we have, uh, the the actual Singaporean population who are citizens of Singapore is only three point five million. So so one point five to two million are foreigners who are who are working here. You know, uh, just the way I came to Singapore twenty years back. Uh, so we have nearly fifty percent of our population is uh, is foreign uh, are foreigners, and uh, and everyone knows this. Everyone followed it very strictly. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll go to the next um, slide. So, uh, and, and I'm going to have now, I guess, three more slides. Uh, how Singapore will unlock, how businesses will unlock, uh, and how aviation will unlock. Okay, so to give you an idea. And so just before we go into how Singapore will unlock, I just wanted to take you through a bit of timeline. So Jan, Jan 2020 is when the first case of COVID was detected in Singapore. So it was very close to uh, uh, to what China China detected it. I think in November or December, debatable. But yeah, what is in the press? So Singapore detected its first case in Jan. Um, in February, uh, the WHO had already given a name uh, to this uh, infection and called it COVID. Um, so we got a name uh, and then in March, uh, this was classified as a pandemic. As soon as it was classified as a pandemic, uh, Singapore implemented uh, this strict uh, lockdown, but it's not called a lockdown, it's called a circuit breaker because the main objective was to break the rate of infection um, uh, spreading through the population. So there were strict rules and regulations, but essential life continued. Companies were closed down. Everyone ha uh, since, since now, I think it's three months, uh, but who's counting? We are all working from home, except the essential services like hospital, healthcare, um, uh, the, the ports, um, and essential manufacturing industries. So the rest of them, everyone is working from home. We are still working from home. Um, in April, May, we went through this district uh, circuit breaker. Um, Singapore closed down completely but we could still go out and buy our uh, buy our uh, essentials we could still go out for exercises as long as we were alone not in groups not in even families we we had to like stand separated so now where we are uh, we are in june um, which is uh, so the circuit breaker achieved its um, uh, objectives the local population infection is uh, is in the range of 20 infections per day now however the total infections is still around 300 which is a concern for the government so this large number of 280 over uh, infections per day is mainly restricted to um, a demography of uh, of uh, of the worker population which is uh, which is uh, foreign workers who are housed in uh, dormitories so they so they are in a in a dormitory very close to each other they they live and work together and hence the infection is spreading over there like just like wildfire you know and and that is where the government's focus now is is to break that circuit in the dormitory population uh, but this is still going on i think it's a month and a half now that we are seeing uh, 300 over infections per day um, um but yeah the recoveries are also uh, very fast because all these uh, people, uh, all these men and women who come to work in Singapore as uh, as foreign workers, mainly involved in construction, manufacturing, they are young, they are strong, uh, and so uh, uh, it's it, it's not resulted in uh, in as many deaths. Maybe there's been like three or four deaths amongst the uh, worker population, but in the local population, yeah, it's just around 20 infections per day. So we are now in the phase one of opening up. What does phase one mean? Uh, that that businesses that do not uh, meant 
was that this was from um, uh, late last month to to mid July. So business that did, do not pose a high risk can open, and you and people can leave home, but for only essential activities. No loitering around, nothing. You must have a purpose that you're going to uh, fuel up your car, or you're going to the doctor, or you're going for shopping. Um, uh, essentials, just groceries, not not the others. So the hairdressers and all, uh, yeah, so, some were opened up. Some of these essential activities were opened up. So we got to get our hair cut after like two and a half months in uh, in Singapore. So this is passed. We the government has seen that the response from people is still good. Everyone diligently wears masks, keeps distance, even on local public transport. Um, so they have now gone into the next stage, which is the transition phase, which is a phase two. Uh, since uh, since uh, um, like late late last month, um, so more businesses are open. You can you can now see uh, hair cutting salons open. You can see uh, restaurants and uh, restaurants and bars are open, but only bars are not open. It's, it has to be a restaurant um, and bar. Uh, all students uh, return to school, but but even um, the students returning to school have one week um, in class, one week online. Um, and sports and rec recreation facilities are open, but not so much gyms and uh, yoga classes and such where people um, have intense exercises uh, in proximity of each other. So this is where we are now, the safe transition. Um, we, we are now waiting to see if by mid August uh, or end of this month, uh, end of this month, we go into the phase three, which is a, which what they call as a safe nation where gatherings and events can resume. But I think the key mainstays, which is uh, travel and transport will still stay closed till mid August because while Singapore might open its airports, but you know, uh, or cruise cruise centers, but does not mean other countries will accept uh, people from Singapore, you know, or transiting through Singapore. So that might take a bit longer. Yeah, so any questions on this? So as you can see how Singapore will unlock uh, and the leadership, so, the strong sir, leadership me, taken by the government. Excuse me, I have a question. Uh, uh, I am Dr. Shune again. Uh, hello. Yes, yeah. Uh, sir, uh, one question. Uh, arise in my mind is that uh, in India uh, it is very difficult to maintain discipline, uh, particularly public discipline. And how does a country like Singapore where there are there is a population of migrants, like there might be a huge uh, Indian diaspora there, how do they manage uh, with those uh, situations? Or is it because that most of the people, those who go there, are educated and from other countries, and uh, they may have fear in their mind about the uh, government and all. How, how does it happen that there is a uh, discipline and everything goes very smoothly? Yeah, actually, on that first point, you know, about highly educated, what we are finding is that the highly educated people are the ones who are creating problems because they seem to think they can they can do whatever they want and have their rights and this and that. Uh, the the worker population is quite quite disciplined. They are here on temporary work permits, so and they are here to earn money for their families back home. So so they follow the rules uh, quite well, um, and they are very very disciplined in that manner. Uh, also, there is the uh, there is the stick that Singapore has that they can just cancel the work permit of these. Uh, uh, of these people um, immediately, you know, and, and and Singapore has done that. But what we are finding is that, um, uh, and I, I mean the, that that these uh, uh, these educated, highly educated, well well earning professionals are the one who create problems because they want their freedom, they want to do everything they want, and and try to play uh, play with the rules. However, the coming to the question of uh, how has Singapore managed, as I said earlier, Singapore has not managed this today. I mean, right from the beginning, Singapore is a fine city. Everyone is used to the strict discipline as far as rules go and the enforcement of rules go in Singapore. There is no leniency here. If there is, if there is um, a certain uh, rule which has been introduced to safeguard everyone, Singapore, the government does make it does make it a point 
to make an example out of a few people to to uh, to get them um, uh, punish them and uh, and then show it show it to the entire nation so here here we we also have this uh, concept of uh, naming and shaming so if you break rules um, like this especially in the covid environment yes your name appears in the papers uh, your 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 passport is confiscated your your uh, right to work in singapore is uh, is confiscated and you have no choice but to leave singapore um, as far as singaporeans are concerned they are highly um, dedicated and committed to the to, to the rules that the the government uh, implements um, and hence the singaporeans are the first ones who who ensure that not only they follow the rules but everyone else but yes we have those uh, stray cases once in a while and they are punished um, quite fast yes. so the you. stick it is not the carrot but the stick works uh, over here <laughs> and uh, migrant migrant population might be having the fear of losing job right that is another threat there like correct uh, the migrant the, uh, the migrant worker population especially come here only for the purpose of working money they don't care uh, about uh, freedom and all that all they want to do is work earn money send money back home so so they do follow the rules although um, the once the infection started in the migrant worker population it's it is spreading like wildfire just because they all are housed in close domestic dormitories you know so that is uh, that is also something that um, uh, that can't be stopped yes sir thank you yeah so you can read through you can see how clearly everything has been like the government has taken the leadership uh, to such a detail level that actually a spoon feeding what people should do what they should not do and there's different ways of communication and, and all that but yeah the stick works any other questions on singapore hello sir yes yuvander is here uh, as per you say singapore is a less populated country so in this situation is it a boon or ban Mm, Singapore has always uh, survived with the with the with the control on population. So there is no rush in Singapore to increase the population in order to speed up the economy. Uh, the main concern of Singapore has always been to look after the well-being of its uh, of its citizen of uh, the people in Singapore through their lives. So that has always been the the. the biggest uh, biggest concern uh, and that is how elections are fought over here and that is how uh, politicians win and the government has been stable for the last uh, 6 60 over years uh, that singapore has been uh, independent so it is uh, it, it is a it is a bane if you look at it just from an economic angle but if you look at it from a human um, life fulfillment uh, it is a boon I will also uh, I will also answer the question here on uh, what Singapore is doing to uh, to look after uh, its people. There are rules. Uh, there there is a whole lot of support that has been given by the government to companies uh, and businesses in Singapore to ensure that Singapore citizen jobs are uh, secure. And so uh, for every for every Singaporean citizen. the the government has given um, uh, part of the salary uh, to the to the businesses for for now 3 months and it will continue for another 2 months um, so hence singapore has um, has managed not to not to uh, have big job losses so i guess that answers the previous question on what about job losses but i'm coming into more details in the next slide so i hope that question was answered thank you sir okay let's go to how businesses will unlock um so since the government has taken also can i ask a question sure sure go ahead 
uh yes uh, i'm sayli uh, sir as you mentioned that the recovery uh, rate in singapore was I mean is uh, very high and uh, since at the beginning you gave us the reference of pune although the cases are low uh, but the deaths have been significantly higher so i gather that there is uh, i mean it is eminent that uh, there are uh, lots of disparities as far as the health infra- health infrastructure is concerned between both the countries so uh, i would just like you to comment a little bit on the health infrastructure in uh, in singapore yeah so one of the uh, you know it goes back to the pie chart where uh, 70% of the economy is uh, is services and one of those big services is um, is uh, the well being uh, or uh, lifestyle um, lifestyle services uh, uh, in singapore so as far as citizens are concerned um the singapore government has taken full responsibility to ensure that the that that good uh, good care is taken um so as uh, as soon as the infection is detected it doesn't stop there the government goes after uh, after uh, contact tracing on all the people that that this infected person met in the last 14 months or uh, 14 days or uh, or a month uh, goes and tests so testing contact tracing testing Uh, that infrastructure is uh, is very strong and um, and it's very well done so what it helps to do is prevent and break the spread of infections because as soon as as soon as someone gets infected and and the contacts are traced all of them are put under quarantine for 14 days some of them who uh, who need uh, who have been infected uh, and are called as asymptomatic um, uh, carriers they are put up in in um, uh, in in like uh, uh, government now uh, government acquired either hotel rooms or uh, uh, or in uh, resorts uh, which are uh, which are for uh, and there are quite a few resorts in uh, in uh, in singapore which are very simple uh, and is mainly used by common singaporeans when they want to go out for uh, uh, you know like sort of take a break from their own daily lives and just go and live somewhere else so they go and rent these chalets um, and this so also so these people are put for 14 days in in quarantine uh, in isolation in these um, in these places uh, then the third is the hospitalization so for hospitalization singapore had long back um, set up a, a huge uh, as you, as as what i guess you know in pune uh, the balewadi stadium where all the bed, beds and all are prepared so so in um, uh, in singapore we have a huge uh, expo area Uh, so expo halls so those whole expo halls were converted into uh, uh, hospital cubicles with with the, uh, all the medical care with volunteers uh, with, from within singapore as well as medically trained um, uh, uh, nurses and doctors um, ensuring that uh, that uh, hygiene and and good care is taken um, so it's not so much that i do not see that uh, that a city like pune is lacking in terms of infrastructure um i see what it is lacking and uh, is is that start you know what do you do as soon as an infection is detected uh, and the the ball falls right over there uh, because what is not done properly is contact tracing for example uh, so it does not break the circuit i mean people la- people also tell lies they don't want to they they don't feel the need to tell the truth and all that so that so that's where the ball gets dropped and once the ball gets dropped what happens is infections increase and it just overwhelms the you know, the population uh, what singapore also did because it is a nicely ring fenced uh, city state stop all people from coming in or going out which i don't think pune can do um, so you will have people coming in and uh, going out there's always travel uh, travel happening the uh, the bus stations and the train stations are all uh, all still working you know so Uh, so you can't stop that and that is one of the biggest uh, challenges uh, for uh, for any city in india okay so thank you yeah. so yeah i wouldn't blame so much the infrastructure i would um, i would look at the uh, specific uh, context of pune which is a uh, bit different than singapore where you can literally put a fence around singapore and ensure no one comes in or goes out so we looked at how singapore will unlock how will business is unlock because of the leadership taken by the government uh, the government has been very uh, insistent and very has enforced that 
businesses will not call people back un to office unless it is essential or necessary, completely necessary. And even then to do that, um, in the last two months, uh, businesses had to first seek permission from the Ministry of uh, Manpower. Um, and then they would be given like uh, each each person who needs to go back to work would be would be given like a, a QR code or a token to enter office um, and only those people could go in. Uh, so uh, so with that leadership, businesses have then uh, sort of uh, uh, aligned with the government and, and they have uh, they have uh, they have ensured that they follow all the rules and regulations uh, from from the government itself. So phase one, June 2020, what happened was 75% um, of the economy um, uh, was expected to resume. I don't think is it is still at 75% uh, because uh, we have still not, uh, we are still in a careful wait and watch uh, situation. Although businesses have opened. Now, so businesses were allowed to open, manufacturing was allowed to open, um, uh, more and more medical services like clinics were allowed to open which was also closed for two months. Even doctors clinics were closed for two months. So all these businesses that operate in settings with lower transmission risks were allowed to open. So manufacturing, production facilities, semiconductors, medical technology, businesses with employees working in office uh, that do not require interaction with groups of people like finance and insurance, they are open. So they have to go out and, you know, insurance people have to go out and, and sell. Finance people have to uh, go back to their banks because they can't take their work home uh, and such, you know. So these uh, these uh, uh, services were open. There was a clear, clear, uh, I mean, if any business wanted to know whether they can open or not, uh, they, the, there is a link on the, uh, on the Ministry of Manpower website where you can go and check if your business qualifies to open or not. So the the details have gone down to much granular level to to even uh, check whether your business can open or not. So my business, so my uh, organization um, is in the business of uh, developing uh, software and providing uh, reservation systems and um, uh, and uh, check-in systems to airports and the airline industry uh, as well as travel agents. So we do not we do not necessarily need to go to office because we can do our work from home. And hence, my entire office, which is around in Singapore, is around 240 people, um, have all been working from home for the last two and a half months um, because it's just not necessary to go to office. So uh, phase two, uh, so so phase one uh, was carefully open with a with a strict list, a granular detail of uh, of uh, businesses that were allowed to open. Phase two was opened even more. The service economy was open. Restaurants, retail shops, departmental stores, uh, personal health and wellness centers uh, uh, were open. Um, so, however, um, still places where there's large congregations like museums, entertainment venues, uh, even uh, places of uh, uh, religion, um, they were they were all they are still closed. Um, okay. So where people gather in large numbers, uh, in, in general, we can we can now go out. We still have to wear masks. Uh, we still have to register every time we go into a, a departmental store or any even the smallest shop. You have to scan a QR code saying you are checking in and then check out. So contact tracing is very easy uh, uh, later on. Uh, so these uh, these rules are still there, but yeah, we can go out and socialize now with five people. Uh, at the most, so families can go out to restaurants and, and meet other families as long as we are um, uh, not more than five people. So the business considerations that, that the government has given out to companies in uh, in Singapore is that is to monitor cash flow for at least the next four to six months. So the government has told businesses that you must monitor your cash flow, cut down on non-essential expenses. Uh, reduce fixed costs like reduce rentals so um, a huge portion of real estate is also into leasing and renting you know like my company's office all office buildings are all rental and lease so those uh, those uh, uh, real estate uh, organizations have given um, um, uh, ha have not have not uh, charged uh, companies for uh, uh, for the entire rental but just 
a bit to ensure that the that the daily maintenance and um, and upkeep goes on um, so rentals have been reduced yes there is uh, there is a there is a also uh, a, a sort of um, suggestion to also look at staff headcount temporarily freeze new hires uh, halt large commitments and investments and prioritize expenditures so as long as you can pay at a later date try and pay at a later date so for the airline industry it means that what we are seeing is now what we call as negative bookings you know so negative bookings of like i think last month the negative booking was around minus 3% means uh, versus the month before which was minus 27% means people who have booked travel are now asking for a refund so there's the negative bookings but however these the the refund of those payments by airlines is being phased it's not like as soon as you apply you get the refund uh, so the airlines are accepting they will refund but to manage cash flows they are trying to see if they can make the payment at a later date so that they can save jobs now pay salaries with the revenues that they have and sort of uh, push back the costs you know uh, because this is not this situation is not expected to remain for more than uh, five or six months what the government has also said is that for local businesses the demand is expected to be flat initially but will recover in a few months in retail business for other types of businesses it may take up to a year for the aviation industry which i am in uh, the the airport and the airline the the key airport which is changi airport and the key airline which is singapore airlines have said that their recovery will take uh, at least until end of 2023 to come back to pre covid levels so it's uh, three years for the aviation industry and then we await the phase three. Uh, we we still don't know whether uh, the government will go in, or they may go into phase three and go back to phase two, depending on how how it works. But phase three means that everything will open, people can go to offices, but there will still be some minimum rules, you know, that you can't congregate, um, you have to wear your masks, uh, use hand sanitizers, and and such. Um, and even some travel will begin, provided Singapore can uh, can sort of like negotiate um, travel corridors with countries that that are important to it so there's this new new uh, terminology of uh, either travel bubble or travel corridor being uh, being used it just means that uh, individual countries are negotiating with other countries to open safe travel for uh, their citizens to and fro any questions uh, on excuse me sir yeah go ahead uh, this is uh, Professor Andiwe. Sir, Singapore has some wonderful universities which rank amongst the top 100. Overall, the education sector is uh, very, very well known. So, how has the education sector been impacted by uh, COVID-19 situation and how have they responded to it? I think that's a, you know, that is a, a, a very good question, Professor. And, and I'll tell you why. It's because Singapore is so, it's so, um, I don't know what to call it, uh, so OCD, you know, about uh, education that they, they, they are very, very reluctant to close down schools and colleges. Uh, they had to do it for a month, but that, but it has never happened in the history of uh, Singapore. I think the last one was maybe 1984 or something because of some similar crisis, but Education is top on the mind. They closed down the entire Singapore, but ensured that that students were the first ones that could return back to universities and schools. Um, because education for Singapore uh, internally is very important for because they look at humans as we are in. I mean, over here we have no resources other than human capital. So, uh, so this is um, uh, something very, very important to the to the government. Uh, and how have the universities responded? It's not just the universities and school institutions, but with support from the government, uh, proper uh, uh, infrastructure was immediately set up by government for its schools and its universities to have uh, online uh, courses and classes. Um, so, and it and it worked out really, really well. I know this was tried or tried out also in India, and I'm sure IMDR. Uh, is also doing the same even now, you know, but there's always problems with infrastructure, problems with regulating the class and all that. Yeah, but in Singapore, it was uh, with the government support was uh, very strongly okay. uh, 
Thank you. Thank you. The university schools were uh, were uh, were still. So I think we may have lost a, a month of uh, of uh, proper education. But yeah, everyone is getting back online. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Online and on track. Sir, Shamika here. Yes. Uh, just another question in line with uh, sir's question. So uh, you have mentioned that uh, there are temporarily uh, the businesses are temporarily freezing new hires. Yes. So uh, won't the newly graduates then get job opportunities? I mean, how, how are the institutes then tackling the unemployment that will occur due to this decision? Well, and this is a point for which no one has any answer and there is no answer even in the in the open media. Um, I mean, all that Singapore government can do is to ensure that the jobs of its citizens is prioritized first. So that is why the Singapore has supported businesses financially, uh, as well as uh, mainly financially, as well as, well as some regulations are concerned, uh, as long as they retain uh, jobs for Singaporeans. Um, so what will happen is um, uh, what I think. Uh, one can speculate is that going forward, um, if if there's more local uh, local population, new graduates coming out, they will get much more higher priority than than uh, anyone coming from uh, outside. I mean, there are already rules in place. Uh, there is already rules that um, before before letting certain jobs go um, uh, up to a certain salary threshold. Businesses have to look for local talent for at least six months before they can they can go out and source from elsewhere. But I think that will become more and more uh, strictly enforced now. But yeah, I mean, for a period of time, this is a period of ad adjustment. There is there is no rules, but uh, there, there is no uh, no answer. Um, but yeah, the government is doing what it can to ensure that businesses are supported as long as they support local population. And this is once again difficult for a country like India because uh, one cannot dif differentiate, you know, oh, only Pune residents will get jobs first. Yeah, it doesn't work like that. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. So I guess as we are going along, I'm I'm sure I'm also answering the question on unemployment uh, that was raised earlier, and uh, there's a bit more to come. So how is the uh, how will the aviation sector unlock? Um, frankly, uh, uh, as was pointed out uh, rightly earlier by uh, Doctor, that uh, that um, that you know Singapore is connected to the entire world because uh, because we are a we are a main transit point for people and goods. Um, so anything, everything that happens elsewhere impacts Singapore immediately. And so the global aviation sector has seen uh, a loss of around 100 million jobs globally. So as far as Singapore Airlines is concerned, which is the main airline in uh, in Singapore and the mainstay, as far as our air um, air travel or air transport is concerned, um, so they are only operating at seven percent of their scheduled capacity in the month of August. So they were even lesser. I mean, they were just operating at three percent. Now they are going up slowly, seven percent in August. Um, the the airport, which is uh, which is a key economic um, uh, Contributor has closed uh, two of its four terminals uh, for at least a year, year and a half, and uh, there was a new terminal being constructed, which was supposed to double, double the uh, uh, the airport capacity in Singapore. So that has been pushed back by additional two years. So instead of 2025, I think it will open in 2027 or probably 2030. As far as job losses are concerned. Uh, yeah, some companies have cut jobs. Rolls Royce in Singapore has cut around 22, 40 jobs, and Skyscanner, which is uh, like the Expedia and uh, and My Trip and all that, they have cut jobs. But we do not see job cuts in the two main two main uh, companies of Singapore, which is Singapore Airlines and Changi Airport, because they are still uh, they have taken pay cuts. Um, they have put they have put. Uh, some people on no pay leave for two, three months, like for example, uh, cabin crew 
um, as well as uh, airport staff who check in no longer needed. So they are they have been put on uh, no pay leaves, but uh, there are no job losses, um, permanent job losses uh, as such in these two main uh, companies. But yeah, some supporting companies have cut jobs, uh, including my uh, the organization that I work in. Uh, we are still uh, we are still uh, maintaining our staff strength. Uh, there are plans to cut. Uh, stuff, but um, we do not. But that's a global effort. We do not know whether any jobs will go in Singapore or not. Uh, remains to be seen. But yeah, I mean, Singapore is not just about Singapore and Changi. Uh, we, in the end, we also rely on uh, on uh, airlines um, and airlines such as Qantas, who have cut 6,000 jobs in Australia and stood down 15 15,000 jobs. Means. For for, uh, for Singapore, Qantas is a big airline because uh, it uses Singapore as a as a transfer hub to go to Middle East, to go to Europe, um, to go to South Africa. So it's a it's a huge airline for us. So if it cuts uh, jobs and cuts flights, means uh, it affects uh, Singapore even more. Now, similarly, Virgin Aus uh, Australia has gone into bankruptcy now uh, and has stood down uh, 8,000 works. Similarly, there's another airline which is important for Singapore, which is Emirates. And Emirates also is cutting a similar number, five six thousand uh, jobs uh, in the airline. So if you see, once the airline, it's not just Singapore and Changi. We we will retain jobs for our uh, our citizens, I guess, in Singapore. But it does not mean that the aviation sector and economy will pick up because other airlines are cutting their jobs. So we also see the third key airline for Singapore, which is Cathay Pacific, has also reached out and has. It needs to be supported by the Hong Kong government, um, and that is that is the state of affairs. So, how will the recovery go? Uh, and I think this is best represented by by this graph from uh, IATA, which is the International Air Travel Association. Um, uh, so, if you look at 2019 as an index of 100, so if you consider 2019 as 100, uh, then what we are seeing is that the uh, air traffic was uh, growing. It had hit 100. Uh, uh, at the end of the year or beginning of the year and then there's a sharp fall so we you can see that the sharp fall is we are at like 30 percent uh, globally uh, as far as um, as far as uh, the aviation is concerned and singapore is tracking along the same lines um, uh, and then it is slowly going to we expect pick up you can see the recovery is uh, is nearly around 2023 for the aviation industry so it is going to go through a lot of hardships, uh, but we are at the we are at the bottom level already in 2020, and now there's only slow recovery that's going to uh, happen over the next three years. Any questions? Uh, hello, sir. Are uh, here? Yes. Uh, sir, uh, I just want to ask one thing that I'm not going to cover. I'm not going to ask you nothing more uh, more than. Uh, I'm not going to ask you about the post-COVID or pre-COVID situation. I just want to ask you, sir, that uh, in India, for uh, there are uh, there are giant government entities who are, who are now turned out to be a private sector for better manner of running and for better manner of investment. So, is there any scheme in Singapore also? Was there any entity turned out to be a private sector? Um, I mean, uh, some most of the key industries in uh, in Singapore are all uh, private or uh, or uh, uh, autonomous you know like for example singapore airlines is a private uh, uh, is a private airline it's uh, it's listed on the stock exchange but of course it has a huge government uh, share uh, stakeholding in it although it's a minority but still it's a, a big uh, stake so the way the, the way singapore is uh, is that uh, all the essential services that are uh, essential for, that are critical for singapore to continue, you know, uh, operating, um, such as hospitals, schools, um, airlines, uh, the seaport. They, they, uh, at the most, they will become uh, autonomous with with government investment, but they will still be a government investment. So won't get fully privatized. However, the entire uh, the 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 businesses, the key businesses that support all these uh, essential industries in Singapore are all private. So, um, so Changi Airport is privately owned. Airlines is private. Uh, is a private uh, company. Uh, there are many hospitals uh, that are uh, that have investment from from the government, but are 
but are autonomous. So there is a good healthy competition that that Singapore has between the government and private organizations. So uh, that is the way Singapore is going. It is not it is not privatizing for the sake of privatization, but to also compete uh, equally uh, between uh, what is the public sector and the private sector. Uh, I mean, for for India, it's a it's a different uh, different matter. Uh, I mean, India's economy is far huge. Uh, the the issues are much bigger. Uh, so hence the, the there would be a need, I guess, to follow other large economies like European and U.S. economies to privatize as much as possible. Otherwise, there will be no development, and that's the rationale. But Singapore is very small. It will always remain uh, like a socialist uh, country with government investment in every key sector. Okay, sir. I got it. Thank you, sir. Hello, sir. I sir. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I should have go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, good morning, sir. Uh, I would like to ask about uh, what are the relief measures that uh, you know, Singapore is taking for their businesses and uh, especially now the aviation sector, as you said, they, they are facing a lot of uh, slack uh, in this uh, COVID scenario. And also, uh, I think uh, because uh, this sector will take a lot of time to recover as well and they are private. So then what is the uh, government or what then what are the businesses doing to like try to cover up or what are the plans for the future yeah singapore can't do much about um, how well the businesses will do uh, the the governments uh, in the end any government even even the government in india as well as in singapore any country the main the main thing is to ensure the that the that the livelihood of its uh, citizens is protected uh, and in that respect uh, singapore has uh, has given financial support to the extent uh, so it's not just financial support to businesses the financial support is in various forms uh, in terms of uh, uh, easy loans uh, in terms of uh, paying part of the uh, salary like for example 75 percent of uh, every Singapore citizen's uh, salary um, up to a certain threshold of uh, uh, $5,000 or $4,800 uh, is being paid uh, to, to businesses to ensure that the local citizen jobs are protected first. Um, so it's not just give, give benefits without any returns, you know. So if you're taking money from the government and if you're getting relief measures, then, then you have to um, keep people's jobs safe. And that is the main, but Singapore can't do much in terms of uh, how businesses uh, uh, can manage themselves. You know, many businesses are closing down, um, but uh, the government's uh, uh, priority is towards its own citizens first. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So uh, even at sure, an individual uh, level, we we did get uh, some you know some extra cash in our bank bank accounts uh, for two months. Uh, just to help with uh, with any because uh, medical medical uh, fees extra expenses because we are working from home so they did give some a uh, little bit of money for two months. Okay, sir. Uh, yeah. Sir, this is uh, Professor Andiwe again. Uh, yeah. Just like education, another uh, key area uh, of Singapore economy is Singapore port. Now, I know you are from aviation side, but do you have any idea to what extent the Singapore port is affected and how they are planning to come back to their uh, original levels? Because it's supremely efficient port. Yeah, I mean, the one of the, I mean, you can't say positive, but yeah, one of the, the pros, uh, I mean, one of the, uh, the, the shining examples during this uh, pandemic has been uh, the cargo uh, sector, you know. So when I say port, it is the cruises, the cruise business which has been affected, cruise line businesses, because uh, that that's where, you know, it blew up uh, in the entire world when when many cruise lines uh, reported infections and and they just had to stop. But as far as cargo is concerned, air cargo as well as uh, uh, sea cargo uh, has picked up a lot. But the 
but not in so much terms as uh, as to uh, as to be equal to how it was before uh, before covid uh, the, the impact on uh, on on the shipping in uh, on the seaport would be the same as uh, would be in line with the impact to to all these good producing manufacturing um, uh, as well as retail trade uh, so these the impact on this would be the same as uh, as on uh, on the ports uh, but the ports are busy okay. the, even the airport okay. are busy but only the cargo divisions uh, and it's mainly everything to do with medical supplies the necessities going back and forth you know, so they are not high value high value uh, uh, items like cars being being uh, transported so uh, so the impact is bad but they are still busy i do not know the number so singapore so port is a singapore port is a supremely efficient logistic machine so yes, let's hope uh, it, it stays that way. yeah and but when i when i take a walk along the coast uh, yeah nowadays i do not see um, as many ships you know in uh, parking ships, outside yeah. uh, in the ocean yeah so yeah. singapore is the largest what they call the the parking space for ships um, yes uh, in yes. the world mainly because uh, because of the efficiency there's there's not much uh, time required from the moment a ship uh, comes into comes into port to the time it turns around with the uh, with offloading goods and unloading goods you know so uh, but yeah i do not have and, I, and i'm sure if you go to the internet uh, it's very easily available okay thank you sir yeah, but I do know that cargo space has run out in the aviation sector. So it, they, these days, even uh, <laughs> even if you got to ship ship stuff uh, like uh, parcels or, or things like medicines and all that, it takes a lot of time because there is no cargo space uh, available, uh, even at the origin as well as the destination. Right. So I, I have. Uh, Included some resources here. I can share these slides with you, and then um, uh, and then yeah, you can look up these resources, which are all uh, government and uh, uh, related. So you will get precise information. One of those things uh, in Singapore is that being small again, um, things are run very diligently, and uh, and you will get uh, very accurate information on any government website uh, that you go to. So yeah, that is all I have uh, for now. And I can perhaps uh, drop this uh, file um, into the chat room so that anyone who wants can access it. Good morning, sir. Yes. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. Shashank here. Uh, sir, I had a question. Uh, Sir, so as uh, uh, Singapore, uh, uh, Singapore has uh, circuit breaker measures for COVID-19, and uh, they have completed all. We have completed all one phase, and you are in second phase. So uh, now there are news about you have entered into technical recession. Uh, so what are the uh, chances of uh, graduates to get an employability, and what are the uh, further actions? Uh, you, you will you, the Singapore will take any idea about it, sir? I think what the the best answer to that is if you look at what you should do is is track this uh, this table that uh, that I have uh, put up uh, and go and look at the uh, the quarter to quarter uh, GDP growth, and you will see specific industries in there which are still on a growth path. And those will be the industries where you would have your best chance of uh, of getting employment. So, so every organization and every domain has uh, opportunities for different roles. Uh, so it is more about how you target. So you should get specific, and it's not just Singapore. I mean, even if you if you if you have aspirations to go abroad to any other country, go and look at go and look at their their uh, quarter to quarter performance. And see which industries are still doing well. And if you have if you have expertise or knowledge in that domain, um, yeah, the, there would be uh, jobs. You know, like for example, there are still uh, jobs uh, that are uh, people are still finding jobs uh, uh, related to um, artificial intelligence, related to robotics, um, uh, all these uh, high value industries. So uh, so you should you should look at look at a chart like this for every country. And, and do a comparison, and that's your best bet. But however, 
the first priority for every government now and not just Singapore, even, even in India or other countries would be to first look after the welfare of its own citizens. So for a while you might find uh, that and you can see all the news in in the newspapers in India about uh, about the US visas getting cancelled and and students who are doing courses their visas were at risk so so all these things are going to happen for a short while for at least a year or so but what you can do is target yeah. yes sir. thank you sir So yeah, I've dropped my presentation into the chat room. So it's for all, all of you. You can. Yeah. Sir, now, sir. Yes. Yeah. Sir, there are questions in the chat box. Uh, do okay. you want me to? Good point. How, yeah, how do how do you want to? I didn't I didn't pay attention to this. So if you've been paying attention, maybe you can just shortlist for me the questions or prioritize them. So I answered the one about industries leaving China. Uh, what kind of manufacturing happens in Singapore is uh, is mostly semiconductor and electronics. And, and yes, I mean this has been the mainstay for Singapore. So the government will continue to look at this sector. Uh, if at all things can be, uh, you know, uh, there would be some uh, flow from China to Singapore. Yeah, they would look at it. But I don't, I don't think there's going to be much. Um, I think I've answered the question on what uh, effort the government has made to uh, to uh, for the manufacturing sector. So it's not that the government can control businesses, but yes, there have been um, like um, uh, many, many uh, government has eased and has requested um, even uh, real estate, real estate companies to ease the payment terms, um, given longer credit uh, loans, uh, loans that companies have taken on uh, credit by uh, banks have banks have sort of deferred those payments. Uh, so things like that. Yeah. So the government has supported in, in that respect. Plus, given financial support for uh, paying salaries of its employees. And then buying of new cars. Uh, it had, uh, there's a question on from Vinayak. Uh, Singapore has banned buying of new cars. No, it is nothing like that. Singapore controls the number of cars on its streets. Uh, so every month there is only a certain quota of cars that can be bought. Yeah, and that is all it regulates, um, and that is mainly because the infrastructure is not so much uh, not so much that that you know everyone can buy cars and and the roads will take it. It'll, the roads will get jammed, things won't move. So so there is always a quota. Uh, Israel has seen a huge resurgence in cases since school started. Um, in Singapore, it's been very very well controlled. I must say until now. You can never say, you know, things could things could go the other way, but um, uh, the schools are a main priority for Singapore and every measure of sanitation of uh, uh, ensuring that kids wear children, all of them wear masks uh, when they come to school as well as in classes um, is already is already there. Plus, if there's even one infection, then then yeah, uh, the government closes down the school, does contact tracing. Uh, quarantines everyone so the rules are quite strict uh, i'm not sure about what happened in israel but maybe it was uh, somewhere the ball fell through the gap and yeah, someone may have dropped the ball over there then the last question is about indian aviation Uh, and I'm on, and I attend quite a lot of aviation forums, even in, even as far as uh, India is concerned. And uh, and in India, it's not so much pre-COVID or post-COVID. The aviation sector in India has always been weak, uh, because uh, 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 it is just very inefficient. So even these airlines like Jet, Kingfisher, they were, I mean, they were not efficient airlines. They were nowhere as efficient as any of the global airlines that you see. So they started out big. Uh, the biggest problem was that 
in india there was no price regulation like in china for example there is price regulation you cannot sell below a certain price you know for for domestic travel between cities you have to get the rates from the china government and that puts your bottom ceiling you cannot go below that uh, you can only go above that whereas in india all these airlines jet kingfisher uh, were all were all fighting on lowest prices so customers benefited but the debt on the airlines uh, kept increasing so it was more uh, the way the aviation uh, industry is running in india um, and the airlines are not efficient uh, plus uh, the airport uh, uh, the government still uh, controls a whole lot of the aviation sector which is also not very good um, so it is more uh, the the policy issues in india related to the aviation sector which led to jet and kingfisher doing what they did and they went down so nothing to do with covid over any other questions hello sir rakesh this side sorry rakesh this side sir yes Morning, sir so so i just gone through your linkedin profile so i just want to know about your journey from account executive to the head of the sales and account so how you manage and started your aviation along with that so how's the journey of your entire i mean in 96 uh, we were also in a similar situation uh, because of uh, slow growth in the industry uh, as you have now you know right now you have a very sudden impact but at that time it was generally slow people were not not getting jobs so most of us uh, most of us uh, started out you, I mean, IMDR was the starting point, you know, and many of us started out uh, in IMDR with the jobs that we could get first, you know, quite a few of us. Some of us were targeted, but um, most of many of us were were like just get the job first and that is the first first job. But my first job was from campus, uh, uh, from campus interview in HCL, uh, but it had got nothing to do with my my engineering degree, which is construction. Um, but I took it because uh, it seemed exciting um, and I joined uh, HCL and from there it has been a, a logical uh, growth from uh, from sales and when I landed up in Singapore uh, through an IT company, the second biggest, uh, uh, similar to COVID, what we had in 2002-2003 was the post 9-11 and the SARS epidemic. So that lasted for a year, many businesses closed down. That was when Singapore was a big manufacturing hub. All the manufacturing moved to Malaysia and China and never came back. So there again, I was uh, I had the choice, you know, either to continue to doing what I'm doing or to try and change, uh, adapt to the change. So I decided to adapt to the change um, as I as I as per my advice, you know, uh, I looked at the industry where there are jobs. So the aviation sector was employing at that time. And, and I took up the role and from there I've been in this niche of aviation in different roles uh, for the last 20 years. So sir, so a question to continue that question only. So uh, so now we are almost on the urge of going to be getting world of the corporate. What exactly the corporate because we have done the internship program and we have done most of us done the virtual internship. So the hand which we needed that to how the organization needs to be worked. We didn't see that proper way. So how it going to help or how it going to be an other another way of it. So seeing the situation. So how it's going to be implemented for us to and what areas to be targeted now to make our ground clears now. I mean, every organization has its uh, has different roles, you know, so it's it's not that if you're a finance person, uh, you have less opportunity now or you're from manufacturing, you've got less opportunity now. Uh, so you have to look at uh, uh, organizations uh, that are uh, that have roles to offer and focus on roles that first uh, excite you so that at least when you go into the job maybe it's not the most efficient and most uh, most highest paying you know but it's something that that you that you like uh, to do uh, and hence can grow in that field i think coming out of imdr is the first step uh, and imdr has given you that breathing space plus an extra set of skills uh, to, to to already launch your uh, launch your careers. Um, don't wait for the course to get over to get a job. You should actually proactively already start looking. You have to get ahead of the game. Um, 
be flexible. Um, so, um, I, I mean, I'm not sure this is a very wide ranging question. It is very personal and subjective also, is that because we all have our limitations. Uh, me, I did not have any limitations. So I just, I went for every interview on campus and, uh, and I got into HCL. Uh, and that is how I started my career, but that is not where I stayed. You know, uh, I built up my understanding of the corporate world and then moved on to other things. Thank you, sir. Thank you for info. So someone is uh, asking a question related to FTSE. I mean, the stock market is the stock market. Uh, while uh, first of all uk since brexit is now being seen as a um, sorry i'm answering this question from uh, abhishek here related to why is the FTSE down by 17 percent since brexit uh, england has been confused it is now considered in the financial circles as an emerging economy you know so it is it is down there with us now with with india with the uh, countries like singapore so we are all emerging economies so uh, the, the UK has fallen uh, to, to an em emerging economy level. So look out for all the credit ratings uh, uh, on on UK. I think uh, UK is might be in, if you read the news, you will see that the credit rating for UK might be in line for adjustment to a lower level. And that is why the FTSE is doing uh, so bad. Is that is that a sufficient answer? Or is there something more specific? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Look at the credit rating agencies. Are read up on those? Yeah. They are the they they will tell you. And and reach out. I think one of the main things that has happened during this COVID is that the walls the walls between people has broken down. I mean, I'm speaking to you casually working from home. I finished a, a call, joined here. Uh, now I'll go on to something else. Uh, there is no, the, the walls of these, uh, you know, uh, that we had hierarchies has broken down now. I sit in front of my customers also, just like in plain clothes, whereas earlier, earlier you had to go in like formal dress, uh, a proper professional suit and tie and all. All that has broken down now. Try and reach out to as many people as you can. Some may answer, some may not answer. It's fine. Uh, but be specific. Uh, I also get a lot of requests on uh, from LinkedIn for mentoring and all that. Yeah, use, use channels and tools like these to reach out to uh, more mature professionals who now have the time, you know, to spare. Um, this is the time to network. This is the time to, to meet with new people, to meet with strangers, uh, strangers in the right sense uh, in your professional fields because they have a lot of time to spend. So so do that and somewhere you will get, all of you will get clarity you know, on what, what are the possibilities around you. And that's the only advice I can give right now. Hello. Yeah. 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 For all the queries so patiently. Now I would like to call Divya Patil to present the vote of thanks. Okay. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are, Divya. Go ahead. Uh, so thank you very much, Pradyum. Uh, it's my immense pleasure to present vote of thanks. I, Divya Patil, on behalf of Deccan Education Society, IMDR, would like to thank you, sir, for giving us time and giving the insight on impact of COVID-19 on Singapore and various other overview. It has been a very insightful discussion, sir, uh, because uh, as, as a, we are budding managers, we need to see how the countries are being impacted and to see how, how we will uh, get out of this and see the situation. Uh, the the overview of the economy and various uh, sectors was really informative, sir. Uh, and uh, as as you have said that the uh, and uh, the rules and the penal uh, and the penalties of um, Singapore regulations and the government regulations in handling the COVID situation has been very good, sir. So uh, we are hope uh, uh, as the students we are hoping that uh, we will uh, see the 
actual situation and uh, be able to handle it in a very good way so thank you very much sir for uh, giving such a informative session uh, i would also like to thank our director ms uh, mrs shikha jain ma'am faculty and non teaching staff for continuously encouraging and supporting us for such a corporate connect i thank the entire student organizing team technical support last but not the least i, I thank all my students student colleagues without whom the session wouldn't have been successful so thank you very much sir and everyone dear yeah, all the best wishes to all of you and a good day stay safe thank you thank so you much thank you very sir. much sir thank you, thank you so much Uh, thank you so much sir for your time and efforts thank you so much thanks for this wonderful and enriching session thanks a lot yes yeah, it was really a, uh, an really? enriching session and uh, i am very happy with the way you handled the questions thank you sir and yeah. the, sir the way how you have shown this phase wise uh, unlocking preparation uh, this is really very nice presentation yeah, was really nice it was useful yeah so Thank no problem. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, sir. So, yeah, thanks and and goodbye. Yeah. So I'll close the call now.